Okay, good morning, everyone. Today is the 11th of uh, September. Mm -hmm. Wow, September 11th. September wow. 11th, yeah. September 11th. Thank you, dear friends and colleagues from Ecuador, Elizabeth, Dennis, Irma, and Luis, and everyone else who is here in the Zoom audience and also in Facebook Live for joining us, for sharing this Sunday morning as usual. Today, uh, we have a special uh, meeting as usual. Number one, let me show my screen. I hope we do not have any problem. Uh, okay, so this is the 81st or 80th? Uh, thank you, said something about the 81st. Okay, so but that's okay, I'm not sure. As usual, let's take a moment to reflect. Irma, can you please read this quote and express briefly what you think? Okay, yes. Education is the movement from darkness to light. That was said by Alan Bloom. And yes, we're supposed to be the people in charge. We're the trainers, we're the teachers, we're the leaders, we're the guides to take our students from something that they did not know to something that they have learned and they now know. So and we are sort, sort it, of- Yes. So and we are sort, sort of light bulbs. Maybe, flashlights, I will say. Flashlights in our lives, in lives of others. And because that is, knowledge is the light in our brain in our mind and also in our hearts, because we need that light to make decisions professionally, humanly, family-wise and everything. So okay. education, I think it's a flashlight for everybody. Yes. Thank you. Dennis, what about this one? Briefly, your comment. Advanced mind uh, stretched by new ideas may never return to its original dim dimensions by Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. Uh, yeah, well, yes, it's like what Je um, Irma just um, read. Um, we open the eyes of our students to, to knowledge or to new experiences. And once you're there, like in this case, once uh, your mind is stretched with these new ideas, something that you did not uh, know before, and now you, you, you know it because you were exposed to that, then you will never be the same person again. Because if before you thought that the, you know, it, it, it's day and we have daylight because of something, and then now you know it's the sun that comes out and then he goes around and, and, and the earth goes around the sun and that's, that's why we have day and night, you will never go back to that. And it's the same story with, with our lives. Every time we share with people like, like you, we share ideas, we share experiences, and uh, after this uh, seminar, this uh, roundtable, we won't be the same because we will be having new ideas that will um, open new paths in our profession. Thank you so much. Dear Tania in Lima, Tania, nice to see you. Could you please give us a hand reading this quote and express briefly your ideas? If you, yes, of course. If you are not willing to learn, no one can help you. If you are determined to learn, no one can stop you. I think that we as teachers can help the students to find out what they really want to do in their lives. But also they we need as students, they need as students have to accept that because we can give them all the resources, but if they don't want to do it, so we cannot continue. And also uh, the key word here is determination. You need to be sure that you are there. You need to have the perseverance, the perseverance to, to follow what you want. Mm -hmm. thank, yeah, thank you so much, dear Tania. And finally, Elizabeth. If you are not willing to learn, no one can help you. If you are determined to learn, no one can stop you. I think that is the same quote. Yeah, but different one, opinions. But different opinions, definitely. Uh, I, I always mentioned that a professional development is a personal decision. So you as educator, you decide where to go and how to do it. What are your professional goals 
And if you are determined to reach that goal, no one can stop you, no matter what you want to do in your professional or your personal life. So the only important thing, and this is a message to our pre-service teachers, because now we are living with a new generation of professionals or future teachers. It's like we need to set clear objectives and clear goals. And then we have to be uh, in this decision-making process to decide who or, or what kind of help do we need or what kind of support do we need? And, uh, and that is the important thing. So and another thing is that to be clear that, what, that education is a passion. If you are not passionate about what you do in education, it's better to change to another, choose another path because we have the power as educators to influence in our students' lives. And that is Thank a huge responsibility we have as educators. Thank you so much, dear Elizabeth. So if you want to watch the other uh, past uh, meetings, you can go to Jaime Ankajima, Teacher Trainer YouTube channel and enjoy all of them. <clears throat> now, who is presenting soon? Uh, well, uh, on Sunday, the 18th, we have my friend Madeleine Medford from Costa Rica. She will be giving a conference in Spanish, Una Mirada a la Diversidad. And she will be talking about all the problems that people who suffer from autismo, just like my grandson, uh, have to face. And she will give us pieces of advice. So you are welcome if you want to listen and learn. Then we will have the, our friends from Colombia on Sunday, the 25th of September. After that, our friends from Guatemala on October the 2nd. Then our good friends from Mexico, Orale, from October the 9th. Oh, I did that. <laughs> uh, and, and I didn't know this wonderful woman, but now we are friends. Deborah Suarez, she's the, one number, the number one woman in TESOL in the USA, she will be talking on October the 16th. And also a new good friend from Argentina, Lorena Ojeda, she will be talking to us on Sunday, October the 23rd. After that, we will have the, look at these faces, my God, they are actors. Marina Eugenia, so great <laughs> Yeah, the, friend. The, the teacher from Argentina, they will be talking to us on October the 30th. Then our wonderful, extraordinary friend, uh, Monica Rodriguez, will be talking to us for the third time or fourth time yeah. on November the 6th. And one of the best, I guess, uh, one of the best round tables will be given by these six professionals from six different English teachers association from Latin America. That'll be the last one of this year. And I don't know if the last of all the international meetings. I don't know. I have to talk to myself to see what will happen. <laughs> so who is presenting today? Okay, who is presenting today? These four wonderful friends. Thank you so much, Elizabeth Ortiz from Universidad Técnica Estatal de Quevedo and World English Institute. Thank you, Ilka Guzmán from Experimenta el Mundo. <clears throat> Luis Bermúdez from Universidad de Guayaquil and Dennis Montaño from Universidad Yachat Yacha Tech. Let me say a few words about them. Irma has worked in the educational field as a teacher trainer program administrator and professor of masters and TIFL certificate programs for over 30 years. She holds a master's degree in TESOL and administration of bilingual programs. She also has a BA in psychology and she is a clinical psychologist. She's currently uh, a member of the academic committee at Universidad Casa Grande in the graduate schools. <clears throat> she is the CEO and founder of Experimental Mundo in which she shares her wide experience in exchange programs and establishing international agreements worldwide. Elizabeth Ortiz is a freelance TIFL consultant trainer and certified facilitator. She has presented workshops in Latin America and all over Ecuador. For the last 20 years, she has focused her professional attention to develop and implement training and professional development programs, the design of social interest projects with national and international nonprofit organizations, 
and a content reviewer of EFL course books for international publishing companies. During her professional life, Elizabeth uh, has present, represented Ecuador in ELT forums as an active member of the ELT and TESOL international community. She holds a MAT TESOL, MA TESOL, and OTA certificate on ELT management. Elizabeth teaches EFL at Universidad Técnica Estatal de Quevedo. She's also the general director of World English Institute in Quevedo, Puerto Viejo, and Guayaquil. Let me take a, a okay. Dennis has over 23 years of experience in the field of English language education. He has served as director of the English language program ELP as a, at a prestigious bilingual secondary institution in Samborondon, Fundain, Copay English Institute in Guayaquil, and he is currently leading the language center at Yachai, Yachai Tech University in Urcuqui, Ecuador. Dennis has two degrees in business administration, two postgraduate diplomas in education, and a master's degree in curriculum design, and a master's degree in bilingual education. And he's pursuing PhD in education and also happiness. Uh, he has been a consultant for the Ecuadorian Ministry of Education and an international keynote speaker at several prestigious conferences. And finally, the last but not the least, Luis Bermudez holds a master's degree in teaching English as a foreign language. He is the author of Black Type, Antonio, Wetback, and Alessandro, a story of fall and redemption. He has also published in Spanish, El Colegio del Fin del Mundo. He currently works at Universidad de Guayaquil, and in the past, he has worked as an English teacher and a teacher trainer for other prestigious institutions. He has presented in several congresses inside and outside Ecuador, and his main interest is in reading and writing. Well, I, I, I must confess that I really feel, my goodness, I feel nothing. I feel nothing surrounded by these great people. And, and, and the most important thing is that you are great human beings, and that's what I love from you. Thank you so much for giving us part of your Sunday morning and the screen is yours, okay? So we are going to start with the first question, okay? Mm -hmm. let, me, let me get rid of this. Okay, and the first question is, uh, if you can read it, please, Dennis. Your microphone, Dennis. Yes, how would you describe the reality of the teaching learning process in Ecuador at schools, institutes, and universities? Okay, so who wants to start? Do you have an order or shall I decide who starts? As you prefer. Okay, Luis Bermudez, you can you may start. Uh, well, if, I don't know. I have I had something prepared, but I don't really I don't really know if, if, if it adjusts to your to your question in particular. Can I can I share? Of course, of course. But I don't really know. Okay, there you go. Can you see? Yeah, it's coming, it's coming. Yeah, now, now we can see it. So, well, this is information about education in Ecuador, which is mandatory until you are 18 and it could be public and pre private. Uh, so far, this is what is it is happening, okay? Um, there is public education and there is private education. And the, dis the differences, the distance between one and the other are, are really big because, you know, uh, even if, uh, the I would I would say that the problem with public education is always politicians because there is one government and they do something which could be pretty good and then there is another government that come with different ideas and then it's like they start they want to begin tabula rasa if you know the term from scratch. and it's crazy because. I mean, it's like you are in this, in some sort of, um, uh, like like when you're watching tennis and then the, the ball goes from one side to the other, blah, blah, blah. So education, that's not really, our, at least our system, that's not really something like that. I think that 
the first people we need to educate to be successful are the politicians. So they understand that at least education is something that they should not be, I mean, uh, running at all because it's, it's something that they, they don't understand. They believe they know, but they don't. We do. Well, so public education, it is run by the central government or there are schools that are run by the, the local government. There are also some that are military related. Uh, some are even run by the police. It's free and it's secular. And then we have private education, which is usually uh, uh, something that uh, institutions that are, are, are run by religious societies or private societies or even individuals. And is paid and maybe, maybe secular or religious. Now, the, the big difference here is that they have everything. I mean, um, well, maybe not really everything. It, it really depends, I know. But uh, what I mean is that for some reason, uh, the education here is more consistent. And I would say politicians do not have so much power here. And it's not that I am in favor of private education. I don't really think that it's so wonderful as, as many people believe. But uh, in the end, the results that, 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 that come out the product is usually, it, it usually tells us that there is a big difference. I'm not saying that public education is, is not a quality education. It is in some cases. We have uh, government uh, institutions that are really pretty successful in terms of the, 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 the kind of education they offer, such as, for example, uh, ESPOL, Escuela Politécnica Litoral among some others. But, but in general, the problem is that we face, that we will always be facing, I think it is uh, what politicians do the, the, because they, they are the ones who are in charge of deciding our policies when they don't really know. They have, they may, they probably mean well, but uh, I wouldn't say that they know in some cases what they're doing. The problem is, we go this way and then we decide to go this way and then we sail on a different way. It's crazy, it's crazy. I see many wonderful projects just get lost because somebody else comes with a different idea. So what we should do is to, okay, to have something that a project that lasts not only for, 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 for the, I mean, for this, the time of this government, but goes beyond that transcends this, uh, uh, this government period, and I'm not, and I'm not blaming in, in the, the present government or the one that came before or the one before. It's just things are like that. We want, at least in Ecuador, education to be successful. We need a long-term project, okay, and 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 we don't need this intervention of, of changing because oh, I have this wonderful idea. No, no, that is not really healthy. But this part. What I'm saying is it's just my opinion, okay? I don't know if I'm really answering <laughs> your question, but this is something that I needed to say. Okay, um, thank, thank you so much, Luis. Next, back to you, Dennis. Okay, um, yeah, well, well, Luis gave a very good explanation of, of what happens in public and private education in Ecuador, at least from the top, you know, of, talking about a, a macro perspective that comes from the uh, decision makers. Because at the end, uh, we, we are part of what the government tells us the curriculum is. So, so I, I, would, they, I would probably go to the other side, to the side that uh, Lisa was talking about, that it's a matter of everyone in this field to, to improve uh, their, their professional a background and uh, and their studies and becoming a better teacher. So um, I do believe that uh, a government that we had before into the good things they did was to arrange all the situations with degrees and information for everyone. And one of those was in 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 the uh, schools, schools, high schools, universities, and everything in. And, it, and somehow he forced people to study. So I believe that that's one of the reasons why, well, we probably hear um, 
share. We, we've met with mm -hmm. Elizabeth. I know Elizabeth for a long, long time. And, yeah. uh, and uh, yes, and uh, we, we come from, from, from the old school probably. But today we can see a very young teachers holding master's degrees, something that was not normal in our days. Okay, and, uh, and I believe that it is important. It is important because as I see it, it at least in the English area, uh, people became English teachers and they had two uh, pillars that they had to fulfill. First, knowing the language and then knowing how to be a teacher. So both things combined made uh, good teachers and of course, good teachers created or, or helped uh, good students. And um, I believe that somehow that equation was not balanced in Ecuador for a long, long time. So uh, there were really good English speakers that were not teachers, and there were really good English teachers that did not know English, or their English level was really low. And it probably, uh, I'm, I'm adding this to what Luis already said, because what Luis said is absolutely right. Okay, so I'm just adding a little bit more not to repeat the same thing. So mm -hmm. in this case, I believe that uh, that was the reason why, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've worked in private institutions my whole life, except now that I'm working in a public one. And uh, Students were in this in some of these institutions for six years of school and then six years of high school, and some of them graduated without speaking English. And there were many things be, behind that: a, a, a methodological, a methodological <laughs> strategies, um, teaching strategies, uh, whatever. I mean, there were many things. But I'm going to focus specifically on the equation that I'm talking about the equation about teachers speaking English and teachers knowing how to be teachers. And I do believe that besides what uh, Luis said, and I'm pretty sure Irma and Elizabeth are gonna put more variables into this whole uh, panorama. Um, I believe that that um, situation in which the English and the education knowledge was not balanced, provoked that a lot of our students in Ecuador uh, did not fulfill the final goal when they graduated, which was speak English. And, and in those days when we were uh, teaching school in high school, there were no uh, uh, B1 uh, exit profile or B2 exit profiles like there are today, but we just wanted our students to speak English and, and you know, go out and, and continue with their education. Uh, I'm gonna stop there. So Elizabeth and Irma will have more things to, to add to this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dia Dennis. Now uh, it's your turn, Dia Elizabeth. Okay, um, I, uh, from different perspective, just to support Luis's and Dennis's ideas is that one of the difficulties and the challenges we have had uh, from our teaching perspective is the lack of sustainability in every single project based on that comes from public policy. So I totally agree with that. Uh, however, they have been a, a good, um, good projects that uh, are still in progress. So we could say that with a new curriculum that started in uh, uh, like around more than 10, maybe 14 years ago. And uh, now we have a new, a new material, a new curriculum that comes from the Ministry of Education as part of the, uh, uh, the support that uh, in this case, the US Embassy provided for several years to help and support the Ministry of Education and developing some projects. So now in the public system, there are new materials, so the new guides, and in, they include new um, different and more modern approaches than in the past. <laughs> uh, of course, they are their ups and downs and any project, but I want to mention uh, two, two of several people, uh, sorry for not mentioning some names, but we have a Janice Matz and Marta Ogonio who, who has been 
who have been very, very strong and working very hard in the development or the guides and the, the trying to change the, the, the approach and, and support <coughs> teachers all the time, especially public school teachers. So, but uh, besides that, there are some other problems that, in, that come from the uh, public policy, but also that difference between what the public policy wants, what the institutions need, and the, the teacher's goals, professionally speaking. So there is a total divorce among them because, um, it, well, I have something to present later with the, with the next question, but I, I think that that is one of the main difficulties that we have. There is a total divorce between, we are all part of the educational system, but we all have different, different goals. Maybe we all have different needs and, uh, and that is part of the problem. So I don't know if, if my, my colleagues here agree with this thing, but the teachers something different or they feel they need something different and the, the public policy demands something different from teachers. And as, as from administrators point of view, we have to jiggle all the time and try to keep everybody happy. And that is totally difficult and, all, and it's a total challenge for administrators to do so. So there are different different things that are still in the air. And uh, at the end of the day, we all have the passion for what we do. And that, that is one of the reasons why we are here because we are suffering now some teachers leaving the profession, even some Pre, uh, pre uh, undergraduate students leaving the career in the middle because they they think or they feel nothing can be changed in the process. We have teachers leaving the professions after 20, 30, or maybe 20, or maybe 10 years in the profession, and they are leaving the profession. So, and there are different problems, different issues that unfortunately cannot be solved from, from the day to night. Yeah. Thank you so much, dear Elizabeth. And finally, dear Irma. Thank you. When I found your question, what I thought was an image, and that helps me probably to present ideas. It's my opinion again. You know, it's like the five circles of the Olympic rings. You have five components when you need to try to understand what's going on in Ecuador. One of the circles is the state policy, the government, which I totally agree with Luis. There is no state policy. It's whatever each and every president wants to show off that they have discovered that they're coming with a miracle solution and then change everything and then destroy everything that was done before because they don't want to be known as the El Seguidor, the follower of the previous president. So that's a big mistake. That's a huge mistake that affects the other four rings. Just a, a, a few numbers, 47 to 48% of the educational system is public. The rest is private in Ecuador. The other ring, it's the university. Everything that happens involves the university. And from there, the teacher training, the programs, the curriculum, the syllabus. Those are the professionals that end and they go to impact positive or negative to the students. And then another circle that I always consider is the evolution. What is the main thing that probably we can talk about a little bit? Uh, yes, we're not gonna be changing our government. I'm sorry, we can't do it. But what is the role of the universities? I believe from my own experience and from one hearing from Elizabeth Dennis and Luis and maybe from others, the changes, the evolution in the syllabus and the curriculum for the teachers, it's going very slow. So whatever need the teachers presented 20 years ago, 40 years ago, or 50 years ago has not been catch up. I don't have a survey, I don't have a chart, but I had my 17 students and we were chatting about this because if they're gonna be English teachers, okay, masters with that degree, 
they should be aware of what's going on and they should reflect on their role, on their responsibility and the leadership that they should be practicing and, and doing it in their classes and among the institution where they are. So if the universities are slow in catching up all the needs that nowadays our students have, the teachers are the ones that have to assume that responsibility. And what Elizabeth was saying, all the different programs, alternatives, opportunities for teacher training. We have to do it by ourselves because again, no policy in public systems, okay? We have to look for whatever helps us to evolve. And just to finish it, this, because I'm sure we have more time to discuss and that there are all their components. The evolution that I'm saying, and I'm using myself as an example, the pandemic, besides the health component, what, it, what was clear, what was on the table that helped all of us to see, we have been talking about the internet, the impact of internet, the useful of internet, the different tools that we have digital wise. Were the teachers training that? No. Was it planned to train the teachers in that? I mean, I'm saying state wise. No. Were the state schools provided with laptops so that the teachers and the students could start, you know, exercising, knowing, learning, practicing uh, this fabulous tool, internet? Uh uh. No. So my, my experience was okay, nobody trained me. I'm not a digital native, I'm a totally all digital immigrant, but I needed to teach myself in order to accomplish my classes for those two years. And I got hooked, I got engaged, and now I know and I'm learning and I'm evolving, but that's me. And my responsibility is with this 17 students that I have in front of me because I cannot change all those five circles that are get together, that are so connected and they need to move. They should be moving as a very articulated system. That should be happening in our country. That, but again, I don't have a solution, it's my opinion there. I'll, I'll, I'll finish it now. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much, <clears throat> dear. Irma, Elizabeth, Luis, and Dennis for your answers to these first questions. Let me read two or three uh, comments people are writing in Facebook Live. Uh, Janine, Janine Matz, I guess she's from Ecuador. She says, Elizabeth Ortiz, you present very valuable contributions. It would be great to get together and meet with the ministry uh, <clears throat> with our good intentions to help. Thank you for bringing these issues to the light in such a professional manner. Adelante, Thank you, Janine. She Thank says. you, Janine. <clears throat> Janine is one of the, of the person who's been working um, in the new guides for the new curriculum. Uh, and she's doing such a great job and she's very committed and she is American. So she's okay. from Chicago, in fact. Okay. Thank you so much. Janine, you, you pronounce it Janine? Mm -hmm. Janine. 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 It sounds Janine. Italian. It sounds Italian. French. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> eh, li, eh, come on, diamo, come on, diamo. It's a French <laughs> name. <I don't> <laughs> and she also <laughs> says, <clears throat> Irma, I agree wholeheartedly with you. There needs to be continuity and central support from the Ministry of Education as well as quality education in the universities. And our friend from, Pura, from Peru, Arturo Phil Burgos, he says, friends from all around Latin America. Does this sound familiar? To me, it does. Well, uh, our Peruvian friends, my, 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 my countrymen, uh, they were talking about these problems and, and, and one of them mentioned that there should be just one politics of English for both mm -hmm. uh, private and public schools, not to go to different ways. Okay, we don't have that much time, maybe at the end. So let's go to the second question. Uh, I don't know, Irma, if you could read the second question, please read it out. Okay, as uh, soon as I can, there it is. Okay, what are the principal challenges of the teachers 
to become professionals in Ecuador. Okay, maybe you want to start this time, Irma? Okay, well, challenges, huh? all over. Challenges all over. Um, <laughs> let me start with, okay, what I just mentioned it, you know, policies in the university. Um, you need to be uh, looking for yourself and by yourself about different uh, options for uh, being trained, being changed. Um, another uh, challenge maybe could be, uh, and this has happened, um, not everybody, not every single teacher is open to receive help. So um, it sometimes takes time for teachers to realize that there is a training program that maybe it can come from the coordinator of English area and they can be helped with a guy so they can be up to date in what they are doing. And I'm, I'm not talking, I'm not touching uh, the digital uh, area or the digital world. I'm talking about um, the challenges that we have found, I think the four of us, when we have been training the teachers. Sometimes in that wide variety of teachers, we have ones that need help to be aware of the changes that they need to accomplish way before or way after they graduated. I'm, I'm talking about teachers that ha probably have been working for more than 30 years and they have been doing the same thing for over 30 years. And it's hard for them to open their minds and realize that there is another way of doing things and probably they need to uh, evolve as a, as a profession. Uh, that's one challenge that we need to face. Be aware to have the consciousness that yes, the generation that I have right in front of me, it's a different generation with different needs, with different goals, with different perspectives and with a different view of the world. English in my time was only a class. Nobody saw it as a tool of communication. Probably from there, we evolved to a tool to get a better salary if we got a job. If you were a female, most of the time was a bilingual secretary. If you were not a female, probably you were getting you know, a different salary. But the challenges, the challenges, um, and I'm gonna be probably touching a delicate issue, is money-wise. Why? If you're a teacher, maybe you will get a decent salary and a decent salary that will cover your needs. But at the same time, we need, again, policies that will include budgets for the teachers to be trained inside the country and outside the country. Why? Because if you have never been through an immersion program, wherever it takes you, it can be if you're teaching French, you can go to France. If you're teaching English, you can go to Australia or to Scotland, okay? And if you're teaching Spanish, why not? You should go to Spain. But that doesn't exist. Or if it exists, it goes through different programs that are private. Fulbright Commission has a great help, okay? Fulbright Commission has a great help of that. But uh, UNESCO has pro programs that help teachers. The Banco Internacional, that's the B, they also have uh, programs that help teachers. But see, outside the country, outside the country. Uh, so far, I've been hearing about there is a new organization, the Mineduc, something like that. I still have to do research for that. But the challenge, if you have, if you are a good teacher and you care and it's your passion and it's your dedication, what does the institution and the country do to help you? That's my big question. And I throw it over the table so the rest of the members of this panel of this round table can jump in in the conversation and continue. Thank you. I'll stop oh, now. Thank, thank you. Thank you, dear uh, Irma. Now back to you, Elizabeth. Oh, uh, yesterday I attended, uh, yesterday, it was Friday. Um, I attended a conference with Noam Chomsky, so a total legend. 
And what he said was something interesting. And uh, we were all in my community of, uh, of colleagues at the university. We were reflecting about something that he said. I'm going to paraphrase it. And what he said is that uh, uh, public policy should be hand to hand with education. So it's hand to hand. And it doesn't happen, not in Ecuador. And I wouldn't like to see in this panel as, um, as a wall of sorrows, but a way just to reflect and analyze what are the main problems and what solutions, if there, I, I guess that there are many solutions that we can propose uh, along this panel. But uh, that is one aspect, but the challenges, uh, yes, in fact, the money, Money-wise, as, as Emma said, is one and is part of the teacher's concern, but there are some other concerns. And the concerns is, um, the main concern is lack of stability. There is a lack of stability, not only in the public system, in the private system. The rules of the games have been changed along these years in which um, we have what it's called uh, contratos ocasionales, in which you, the teachers are higher for one semester, two semesters, one school year, two school years, and then nothing happens. You have to wait for it. And, uh, and that is uh, uh, and, uh, another um, aspect is along this way, uh, that is teacher's concern. So the lack of stability besides uh, salary, of course, that is basic, but it's, it's that those rules of the game. Another thing that, uh, has bothered a lot is that uh, we as English teachers, the, not only the Ministry of Education, but also the Sistema de Educación, la CNC, our classes. So they request from teachers in general to have credentials to be English teachers. So you're required to get your B2, C1 level, and uh, you also require to have your master's in the field, your PhD in the field, to conduct research, to publish. And under this uh, kind of instability is a challenge for teachers to do so. You never know what's going to happen. So you never know what's gonna happen. You never know what comes next. And, uh, and uh, then uh, another thing that happened, I don't remember like around four or five years ago, I don't know, Dennis, I think that you, maybe you are, you are more, more aware of this, is the, in our escalafon, English teachers are in as technicos docentes, which is a technician level. So, and that is not a, a, a technician, but with masters in the field and with a PhD and conducting research and, and it's not being treated. So professionally speaking, English teachers have not at the same category of any other teachers. So, and that affects a lot, the motivation to stay in the field. And that's why some teachers, they, they said, okay, invest in a PhD more than 10,000, $15,000, $20,000, depends where you take the, the, the PhD. And to make the same as a technician level, it's, it sounds unfair, right? So, and that is some of the difficulties and the challenges that we face with a lack of stability, labor stability because of the contracts, lack of, I mean, a, a salary lower than the rest of the, um, of the, uh, in the higher education, I don't know, it happens the same in, uh, in the middle of school. I don't know if there is a contribution about it. I, I'm not sure about it, but, uh, and more credentials. So it means that we are requested to invest in our own professional growth, but what we receive back, it's not, it doesn't keep a balance. So, and those are the challenges. But besides that, we are still here because we love the profession, we love what we do. And what happens, and what happens is that there are two, um, two as a result of this, there are two things that happen. The first one, teachers who are just leaving the profession or another uh, professionals that who are just 
living abroad because they have better conditions. About training. So the pandemic gave us uh, a valuable, a very, very valuable lesson is that you can be trained wherever you are, whenever you are. And to me, that is an advantage. So I have received and I have attended conferences from Chomsky <laughs> to different kind of gurus and professionals because I did it online. And they, it has given us accessibility to some uh, events. Even this one, Jaime, you started this in pandemic because of it. So the yes. networks, the networks in education, our network networks, you know, grown even more. Yeah. So, and that to me, that is a, that is an advantage. So I would say there are some advantages and disadvantages, but the, the, the pandemic gave us or opened a different gate to our professional growth. They gave us more accessibility than ever. And uh, of course, if we have to invest in our own professional development, and there are several conferences for free that we can attend or digital training on professional development opportunities for free, I had the opportunity to do it online. And uh, that was great. So I think that I, I brought a lot of things in the bowl, so, but no. just to answer the question. Th just answer th the question. Thank you, thank you, dear Elizabeth. Now back to you, Dennis, and then Luis. And then we have some comments of the people here in the audience and some comments that we are reading and saving from people in Facebook Live. Dennis? <clears throat> yes. Um, I, well, the, the question is about uh, challenges. And let me rephrase it. What are the principal challenges of the teachers to become professionals in your country, in Ecuador, in this case? Um, I, I believe is being updated. I mean, uh, uh, in order to become a professional, Elizabeth has said it, Irma has said it, you're somehow on your own. There, are, there is help from outside, there is help from in, in, inside institutions, but it's, it's not all, okay? And not everyone can uh, get access to that help. So somehow you have to think that you are on your own, okay? Based on that, it means uh, that it will go to the money-based uh, situation that you need to have money in order to pay courses, seminars. So I, I will go further uh, uh, than just uh, talking about all the situations and problems because I've seen comments on the Facebook chat that uh, it sounds familiar in other Latin American countries because it is, it's, it's the same, okay? It, it happens in all of them, Colombia, Peru, um, and some others around uh, our neighbor countries. But I do believe that uh, then we need to come and try to be part of community of practices, okay? What uh, Elizabeth just said, okay, this professional networks in which what, what do you have to pay? Nothing, it's your time. It's time and I see Tanya right now here and I see her with her camera on, she's participating, she's nodding her head every time. And well, I believe that she's a teacher that care. That's how I call the teachers that go to conferences and Congress and they are always on. They care about their students. They care about their profession because uh, it would be better, you know, just to be lying on bed or watching television or doing something else on a Sunday morning, but she's here. And there's a lot of people on the Facebook live and, and chat posting things and comments to Elizabeth, to, to Irma, to Luis and everyone. So they are here also. They're, they're not, you know, outside in a shopping center or a mall doing something else. They're here because they care, okay? So I do believe that in order to reduce that gap between being updated and not, the communities of practice are really good ways and the, the teacher networks are really good ways to try to update yourself because uh, if there's no money to pay a, career, a master program that might cost between $4,000 to $12,000 in Ecuador mm -hmm. or, uh, or get a, 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 a you know, a preparation for an examination that will also cost between $200 to $500 here in Ecuador and it might go up depending on the institution, then try to become part of one of these communities. I mean, Jaime, you, you know, I, I, I really uh, appreciate the work that you have been doing. And uh, 
I admire you, man. I, I really admire you uh, because we all have international friends. I have had teachers from all over the world, Egypt, Cameroon, working with me here at Dutch High Tech University. But did I make time to do what you have done it through all these years? No. And, uh, and I know you're also a busy person. I've met you in Pura and I've been with you, do, you know, through your process of conferences and all that. And you look for the time to do it. And uh, it's just a matter of wanting to become better. It's a matter, uh, as, as Elizabeth said, and uh, Irma was also talking about this, we, internet has given us a, a special tool. I mean, I've been in seminars all around the world and uh, some of them paid most of them for free mm -hmm. and we get our certificates and we are there talking with high, you know, uh, position, uh, speakers that are at a very high level worldwide and sharing information, knowing what they're doing, knowing these new trends. I believe, yeah, it, it is money-based, most of these things, but today, thanks to the pandemic and to the tools that we have, uh, we can be, I can be today in a meeting at academic council at eight o'clock in the morning in the university. And at 10, I can be at, at a conference given in the UK with uh, mm -hmm. Chomsky or whoever else it's, you know, there. And uh, it's something that we can do now, it's time. Because yeah, I can be, you know, chatting with my friends, discussing about the last soccer game, the last whatever, or whatever musician is doing, or, or something like that, mm -hmm. or I can be immersed, immersed with my teachers, creating communities of practice and trying to improve things that needs to be improved. So I do believe that's the challenge. I mean, I know there's no support or if there is support, it's very uh, mm -hmm. small, it's not sufficient, but today we have created communities. There are a whole bunch of them I belong like to three, four or five of them. And uh, some of them in, in, in Europe, others in the States. A part of yours that was uh, founded in, in Peru. So my friend, uh, I know there's a whole bunch of things we need to do, but we also have support mm -hmm. from experienced teachers that will uh, be there in order to um, make this, the ELT community grow as it should have. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, dear Dennis, and thank you for your kind words to me. Uh, but as, I, as Irma said, if I didn't have friends like yours, I couldn't do anything. So it's not only time, it's not only the internet, <clears throat> but the most important, I guess, is people like you that I ask you and you never say no. <laughs> you have yeah. children, you have grandchildren, you have PhD, uh, magister, everything programs, but still you give your time. It's because as you said, and everybody has said, we love what we do. We love what we do. I imagine if there were doctors, engineers, architects, lawyers who loved their, their, their careers as we do and were passionate, the world would be different. Thank yeah. you so much, Dennis, Elizabeth, Irma. And now back to you, Luis. And then we will have some comments that we are um, receiving in Facebook Live and here in the Zoom audience. Luis? Your mic. You need to turn on your mic. Sorry about that. I'm not there. so technology wise. I, I would like to apologize if, for example, at the moment I am talking because my, my internet connection is, on, is acting up and I don't know what's happening just precisely because today. Because it always happens to the best guest speakers in the thank world. Thank you. No, no. Thank you very much for that. I was right. expecting that quote. <laughs> <laughs> you always to move it. from one place to another just because of it. <laughs> yes, that is the only reason why it happens. Luis. Listen, for, in my opinion, the principal challenge, uh, if you want to become a professional English teacher, uh, at least in Ecuador, is the lack of information that is out there about our, our programs. Okay. A lot of people, and you, I think that you remarked that, Jaime, uh, enter, uh, uh, they start university programs believing that they are going to learn English. 
when actually it's, it's, a, it's an entirely different thing because English teaching, it, of course, we teach English to our students, but it's not the only thing. We, ter we teach them to be, we train them to be teachers, okay? So I think that the first challenge is that you need to have the right information. You need to have everything clear about what you're going to be doing, what you're going to be facing once you start the, any degree program, in this case, English teaching, TEFL, all right? Uh, to know what is the offer. Uh, uh, in Guayaquil, for example, we have uh, Universidad de Guayaquil, we have Universidad Católica, and we also have Casa Grande, that they offer wonderful programs uh, to train teachers, and, 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 and the results are pretty good in that aspect. But the, the needs are many. I say that, that uh, what happened with the pandemic is that it, 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 is, it was really divisive, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, making a mark between what was before and what is now. I was expecting, without this is before the pandemic, that I would be, we would be teaching online like in 2028 or something, <laughs> seeing how things were progressing. But then the pandemic went and we have like to rush a lot. And many things changed. In, 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 in some ways, in some ways, that was a positive thing, really, in some ways. Um, because now, for example, uh, we had to learn more uh, technological, I mean, to make our classes uh, more technological oriented. And, and, and we have to learn uh, about, about all these things. I think that that was very positive. And, and, but there are things that, that are still there that are not changing and that require a close look, a closer look than the one that we have, I mean, at least in, 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 in Ecuador. Can, 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 can I share? Please that... do. All right. Okay. All right, sorry, no, this is not the one. <laughs> All right. So this is a situation of English mm. in Ecuador. All right. Before and during the pandemic, this is, the rank. In 2014, we were, I mean, we were in a better and higher position. We were 35. But then as you see, mm, uh, yes, uh, this is a, the reality. This is where we are in Ecuador. And in terms of the English level. And this, this information I'm taking for from EF, uh, we, uh, which they, you know, they always do this, this uh, kind of uh, measurements country by country. And in, in the level, we are right now number 90 in the world. Um, I, we're probably the last but one, the penultimo, the last but one in, in Latin America. Oops. I don't really think that is uh, the, the English teachers are to blame. As I said, I, I, I would, I insist that is the policies that the government have. They're constantly changing everything. And, the, and, and, what, and the result of that is chaos, complete chaos. Uh, right now, the, go, the, the, the current government is, uh, I don't know if they started this or not. They have this program that you can see the book, the, the book cover is there. Um, and I think that it's not, it's not bad at all. I, I, I've seen the book and they're really pretty good. So I don't know what is being happening after the pandemic myself. There are no official numbers, okay? But uh, most of the schools and institutions that, that were having online sessions, they are now face-to-face, -face, okay? And in all state schools, uh, I'm talking about high schools, they're using these books that go from the, from the A1.1 level in the European framework to the B1.2 level okay so the idea is that um once our our kids finish high school they are supposed to have uh an intermediate or high b1 so to speak okay so as a teacher you have to know these things uh, and, and and why is that <laughs> because we have to make a bigger effort uh, something that everybody has been saying is about the training that the teachers receive okay uh, i agree that Right now, we have wonderful opportunities to get in contact with, I mean, to, to get English uh, in, in a different way from what it used to be in, in, in the past, or at least in my time. We always play jokes, we always make jokes, sorry, about 
Okay, how are you going to learn English? We asked. Okay, I'm going to marry a gringa. That's what we <laughs> said. That's what we said. Okay, because we didn't have what we have these days, all right? Technology help, helps a lot or should be helping a lot. So that's why I said should after be. pandemic, probably the figures are going to change, probably. But um, that's not for sure right now, okay? And, and it's true, teachers have to train. I mean, if, if no, no one is doing anything, we have to do it. We have to get the training. I agree that we need to, to be in, in some sort of immersion program. So uh, I always tell my students, if you have the opportunity to travel, go for it, go for it. And then of, of course they always have excuses like, we don't have money. We don't have, this, is a university, this is a state university. We don't have the money. And I tell them, okay, listen to me. I'm sorry, listen to me. You're, you're probably going to have a graduation party. Tell your parents not to invest in that and, and, and ask for that money and, and, and spend it on a trip. Not only to the United States, because the United States is not the only English speaking country. There are other options. There are other possibilities. There are countries in the Caribbean where they speak English. Why not to go there? It's closer and it's cheaper, All right? Okay. <laughs> if you allow me, Luis, to interrupt you, so two, two things that maybe can affect those numbers is the fact that the Ministry of Education lowered the hours of English. So the hours of English were reduced again, especially in the last three years of uh, bachillerato. So in the past there were five, now there are three. And uh, of course, that is uh, that it's, uh, an effect. Another thing that we have to remember that uh, the new material, the new resources, uh, there was there uh, there uh, there are new there are new um, resources now. So they have different guides, and uh, <clears throat> they are under continuous revision. And uh, but again, the the problem with uh, the reduction of hours of instruction is going to affect the result at the end. Of course. So that That's was my mother. Thank you. <laughs> limited, limited teacher training will, will always be the issue, right? And when I say training, part of that is that we have to master the language. I always tell my students again, sorry about that, saying the same, but I always tell them, okay, uh, the, the first requisite to be an English teacher, to be a teacher in general is to be patient. You have to be patient, a very patient person, but you're gonna mm -hmm. be facing a lot of things. But to be an English teacher, the first thing that you have to do is to master English. You yeah, have to yeah. know English. You have to be able to speak English, at least in a level higher than your students, at least, okay? So that is, that is something that we have to work on, right? And, and, and I tell them, okay, you're not gonna travel, I'll dedicate some time, devote some time of your day to English. Uh, even if it's just five minutes, it's not about the amount of time, but the quality of time. Mm -hmm. Go for something that you like. You like singing, fine. You like reading, go and start with the basic thing like comic strips. There are ways for it. For, uh, if you are in, in if you have your own bedroom, okay, label things, learn, learn those things in English. If you don't know something in English, in, in Spanish, learn it, there, learn it first in English. There are many ways. There are many ways for us to, 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 to improve our English level. So that's what teachers have to do also. If, if, your, if your university program for some reason is failing in that or is not connecting with you, you have to go the extra mile, all right? And uh, I, was, I was writing this, but uh, they are all for remote teaching. Of course, there are, there are connectivity limitations, limited class times and teachers are not, not all of them technology wise and oh, have very little experience in teaching online. So. Usually those classes are conferencias magistrales, <laughs> where the spotlight is on the teacher and not on the student. No, the spotlight has to be on the student. The student has to be the star, if anybody mm -hmm. has to, all right? Um, and high anxiety levels and stress. Yes, there will be a lot of that. And oh, yeah. those students, those students who are there, they, they place a picture, but they are doing something else because they're at home. And it's understandable, but there should be commitment, just like, like in a marriage, there should be commitment. If one of you is going, not going to do or play the role correctly, it's not gonna work. It's a two way street. It's not a one way street. Many students see it as a one way street where the teacher has to do everything. 
a no a no the students have to be active be proactive they cannot be passive subjects anymore that has to be in the past the the mock and the jog model has to disappear Mm -hmm. Or at least it has to change. It has to fall. We have to do something else. Yeah. I'm sorry if I if I bore you out with my. I had to say it. I had I had it no, inside. Me. But that's fine because your I had, word. I took out the beast. Sorry. No, that's fine because your <laughs> word just remind me of something. Uh, Jaime, may I take one minute? Um, one yes. minute running. One minute. Okay, running. one minute. Being <laughs> concise, very concise. <laughs> one of the things that I forgot to say. Yes, there are positive and negative things, but my tribute will be to those teachers, Spanish and English teachers that are working in the rural areas, in the countryside. Those are the ones that show through during all these two years the creativity that they had to even teach using only WhatsApp. I mean, that was the only thing that they had. And having the difficulty of students not even having a cell phone, and I'm talking about rural areas, country, side, and my tribute will be with them. They show us the creativity and the power that they can have when a teacher has the willingness to accomplish their goal, that's all. Okay, thank you so much, dear Irma. Uh, so now let me show you a few of the comments people are making in Facebook Live. Uh, David White in Peru, he says in some religious schools, they put more emphasis on the education of boys than that, that of girls, especially in relation to math and science. Dr. Araceli Salas from Mexico, she says, these are the demands of competition must be. There must be a balance between knowledge and experience. Eric Xiomar, English in Ecuador is just marketing for the government and the English schools. They don't contribute our real needs. They are just uh, opinions of our uh, friends and colleagues. Reyes yeah. Dalila, in Ecuador, students, not teachers have received any books or teacher guides. The government doesn't like to print the English modules, even finish the audios. Fabiola mm -hmm. Aguilar, those results, that those results need to be analyzed. I do believe they don't reflect the real situation of our students. Oh. Marta Ugonio, due to the reduction of hours, Ecuadorian public schools, English teachers are dismissed. Yes. Well, this, this is a wonderful panel of experts. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Yes. Government, government, university evolution, uh, the lack of central, Janine, 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 Janine. Dalian, Janine. Janine. Matt's the lack of central support in the ministry combined with the reduction of English hours from five to three in superior and bachillerato and the lack of printed books contribute to a widening of the social, social divide between the public and private sectors everywhere all over Latin America. The consequences of this are dire when we look at the future of opportunities for public school students. As a linguistic, I can also commend on the cognitive benefits of being bilingual that go beyond the linguistic benefits, which are not allowing public school students to develop. P.S. I'm from Chicago, but I have lived in Quito for 10 years. This is my home. Tu casa es mi casa. Way to uh, go, Janine. Jacqueline Reyes, decent salary. You are absolutely right. Marta Ogonio, Noam Chosky, and Stephen Krashen, the greatest minds in our time. Uh, well, thank you so much for these congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, oh my goodness, we are fans of Jaime and Kahima. Thank you so much. I'm about, <laughs> I, I we all open. are. You have your we all fan. Are. I'll open my fan club very soon. $10 <laughs> to register, $10. <laughs> He's kidding. No, I'm not kidding. I'm not oh, come kidding. On. <laughs> Jacqueline Reyes in Peru, you do need to have a BA one or BA2 level to teach in public schools. And when you want to ap apply for a position for working in public sector, you do not get any uh, pro points. Points. points for international certifications. I, I knew what it was, but I just wanted to let you participate. Of course. Of course. They, they, do not, <laughs> they do not care your level of English. It is unbelievable, yes. And I feel demotivated. Well, Jacqueline, do not feel demotivated. Just study because you want to learn and be better. 
I'm, I yeah. was going to say a bad word. Uh, don't worry about if they if they pay attention to it or not. Just keep on studying because you want to be better, better than yesterday, better than last week. Marta Ogonio, I found here Mauricio Arango. Mauricio. Uh, why, David, again, nowadays master and doctorate certificates can become more important than experience. I know a teacher in Colombia who is 31 years old with a doctorate, he's a coordinator on an important school, yet he only has only three years classroom experience and B1 level of English. This is wrong because he's purely theoretical. My one studies for you know, our university professors had to work for years. Okay, today we place more emphasis on pieces of paper than on experience and proficiency. On our, but yes. Some of the opinions that we want to thank and, and, and thank everyone who is following us in Facebook Live. So here we have Marco Aparicio and Tania and Chante, the future, uh, my substitute in, in 20 years. Thank you so much, Tania mm -hmm. and Chante. Something to say before we go on with the question three and four. Tania, everything you have heard. Yes, I, I like the way how you have shared what you, what you know, because you are the ones that live there and yet a student of education. Uh, perhaps a, if you don't know my age, but I'm 26 years old and I haven't achieved anything yet, but I have goals. And I think that if we want to achieve some goals, we have to learn from the others that have already achieved something. That's why I'm here. I like what uh, teacher Jaime does every Sunday, not all Sundays, I haven't been all Sundays, but I like this. And I see that you are very committed to, to grow more and that's good, I like it. Thank you so much, dear Tanya. Just like you, because as, as Dennis said, you could be lying in your bed, mm -hmm. watching Facebook, listening to music, but you prefer to be here. Marco Aparicio, are you there? Marco? Yes, I am here. Can you Hello, hear me? Hello, Marco in Mexico. Orale, something to say, Marco. Um, well, uh, thank you for inviting me to say something. <laughs> oh my goodness, you, be see careful, how, be careful. you, you see how professional yeah. teachers are driving, listening, uh, reflecting. Yeah, try, <laughs> trying to learn a little bit more, right. Well, uh, uh, it's been very interesting to hear about the situation in Ecuador, um, for sure there must be similar situations and different situations among the different countries in Latin America. And it's been very interesting. Uh, for example, I was uh, carefully listening to the information they gave about the, uh, excuse me, the government, the government policy. Well, probably it happens all around Latin America that, uh, the government does not necessarily uh, base uh, their decisions on academic issues. So um, it is uh, necessary uh, to learn more and try to uh, educate them a little bit. <laughs> Sorry for what I said. That's my point at the moment. It's true. It's true, yeah. Mark. Thank you so much, dear Marco. Okay, now let's let's go to the question number three, and, and I've changed the order. The question number three is, where can you become a uh, licenciado in lengua inglés in Bolivia? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. No, That's okay. we cannot answer that question. Huh? No, no we can skip it. We can skip it. Skip it. You, you should tell me, don't worry, Jaime, it only happens to the best guest speakers. Yes, of, of course. course. Definitely, definitely. So certainly. where can you become a licenciado in lengua inglesa in Ecuador? Uh, they are, I don't know who wants to start this time, maybe. Uh, uh, Dennis, Dennis. Yeah, well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak it broadly, okay? Because my university does not have a career in English. Uh, but um, I've been asking to some other universities in the north part of Ecuador, and uh, it takes four, uh, four years, eight semesters, to get uh, a bachelor's in, in teaching English as a foreign language. And uh, according to what I spoke to, to these directors of these programs, um, it, uh, you, you, one of the requirements that you need to have at least an A2, 
level uh, uh, according to the Common European Framework of Reference. So you, that's like the requirement they have, at, at least in the universities of the North. I'm pretty sure Luis, Elizabeth uh, will, will have a different uh, opinion in the ones in the South, which are in the coast. But in the North it's like that, they, after those eight semesters, you need to do a research project, just a, a research project, not a, a, like a, a master's thesis or a PhD thesis. And they were telling me that they are uh, looking forward to change this into a publishing. They want to have uh, students in order to graduate must publish and be accepted by uh, uh, um, this uh, magazine or, or editorial or whatever. Uh, and in that way they can graduate and they will get their grade. But until today, it's with a, a, a research project. So it takes eight semesters and a requirement of a, a A2 level, okay? Uh, now, as I was saying, um, Elizabeth was talking about the uh, situation of, of, of teachers and the, the format of the contract that we have. And that's because universities have two formats. Uh, some universities have careers in English and those teachers are teachers like the rest of the teachers. They, they do have their normal contracts. They can have permanent or tenure track positions, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Uh, because there's a school of, of English in the university. Uh, and then the rest of the universities used to have teachers teaching students from other careers. And uh, there was a big amount of, of, of universities that still had English as part of the curriculum. And those teachers were also teachers. But with this uh, uh, change in the Consejo de Educación Superior says law, which was one uh, move was back in 2019, the other one was in 2021. Uh, these few universities that used to have uh, teachers or English inside the curriculum of other careers disappeared. Some universities had these English departments being, uh, you know, they eliminated the English department mm -hmm. and because the law said that you can, in order to graduate, you can bring a certificate, uh, a B1 certificate, B1. because they also lower the level before it was B2. Uh, they lower the level to B1 and uh, that they can bring it from wherever they want. And uh, the university has to check that certificate. And with that, they will uh, have all the requirements in order to graduate. And I'm not talking about English teachers, I'm talking about the rest of the careers. So the university, what they did, universities eliminated the English departments of non-English uh, uh, careers and teachers became uh, technical docentes in the best of scenarios. In other scenarios, they didn't, they were not teachers of the university anymore, they, mm -hmm. became, they became the public company of the university teachers. And at least that's what happens in the universities of the North where I am. In our case, you know, Jaime, you came to a university back in 2019, if I'm not wrong. Yes. Yeah. And uh, we are, I think the only one that is, does not have a career that still have English as part of the curriculum and our level did not go down to, um, a, to be one, it's still a B2 level because our students, uh, but they have careers in, in uh, research and uh, they have to go abroad and they study abroad their masters and PhDs. So a B1 certificate, does not, it's, not, they, it's nothing for them. They cannot enter those universities with a B1. So we, enough. we yeah. yes, not enough. So we yeah, still enough. continue with the B2 with an 80 over 120 on the TOEFL IBT uh, test. Uh, I know B2 is 72 over 120, we have it it's over 80. And uh, so it depends. Uh, as we've been talking about the school system and how the government the, you know, manages and, and how hard it is, there are institutions, high school schools, bilingual high schools in Ecuador, in Quito, in Cuenca, that uh, besides all these problems and all these situations, they do fulfill uh, at the end, uh, their exit profile of having students B1, B2, or higher levels. In our case, our students graduate, all of them, with at least a B2, and we do have st students with C1 and C2 levels of English. So 
basically that's like a general view of how it goes. I, I know probably Luis and Elizabeth will go deeper into that, but in the north area of Ecuador, I'm talking about the cities uh, that are uh, north of Quito. Uh, it's it's like that. You know, Otavalo has university. Uh, Ibarra has the UTN University, Universidad Técnica del Norte, and uh, there's also another one in Tulcán. But those are basically the requirements they have. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Luis? Okay. Uh, if you want to be a licenciado, you want to have that kind of degree. To the best of my knowledge, there are only two universities in Guayaquil, which is what I can tell you. That, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, licenciado. Uh, those are the Universidad de Guayaquil and Universidad Católica de Guayaquil. Uh, those are the only two. And uh, uh, same, and you have to complete a levels and in order to, 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 to graduate, you can, even, you can defend a thesis or you can have what we know as a connection con la comunidad, something like that, or internships. Uh, uh, but basically those are the two. In, in the past, we, we have another one, was the Universidad Laica, Vicente Laica. Rocafuerte. Mm -hmm. And that was a, an incredible program. Many, many wonderful English teachers came out of that, but for some reason, it closed down. We don't know, <laughs> but uh, that was our main competition. <laughs> now it's only us. Um, and when they graduate, they have to have they, they must uh, reach the B two level. Uh, the rest of the university supposedly, if you graduate from 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 any other program, they they are supposed to have the B one. But uh, in Escuela de Lenguas or uh, Facultad de Filosofía Universidad de Guayaquil, uh, you have to demonstrate a P2 level. The only problem I see in that is that uh, we don't have an international exam. You know what I mean? So, and uh, uh, really those are the ones that say you have this or that level. We have our, our own examinations, but I suppose that they, they, the problem is money-wise. So, because you have to pay these people, all right? But basically those are the things that you want to be licenciado in uh, in my area, which is Guayaquil. I don't know very much about the rest of the country, uh, but that's the situation as it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Irma. And then uh, Elizabeth. Yeah. Uh... I was related when you guys were talking about the disappearance of all the English programs or English areas or English departments at the university, because I was actually one of those teachers that was during the weekends in one public university. We were there to support, to help, to improve, to teach students from A1 hopefully to A2, but then the changes in law, the changes in policy, then all those English areas vanish. So the good thing is I got my weekends off because I was teaching on weekends, Saturday mornings and Sundays afternoons, all those two days. But bottom line is just like um, Luis just said, if you want to get your titulo de tercer nivel or your licenciatura, you just have to go to the university that offers a degree study the four years or the eight semesters and then you get your title what some of the universities state and private overcome the situation of not being um, ready to apply this uh, exam to confirm that the graduates are getting b1 b2 uh, is that they have related the sound agreements with uh, what we call examines internacionales or the, certif the international certificates or the representatives here in the country. So the students at the end, they just go, uh, they take the exam and according to the grades, they're officially in the B1 or the B2 levels. Uh, I have a not 100% experience with a university in Libertad the Universidad de Santa Elena, because I, I taught there and I'm still somehow connected. Um, that's what they did. They, they got in the big auditorium, all the students that they were graduating from other careers. And, and also I think they were starting a, a program for becoming English teachers. 
And that's what they did. Just get the support of organizations that are related to international certifications. They, you get your certificate and voila, you get your licenciatura and your certificate at the same time. That's my experience. Okay, thank you so much. And finally, the <laughs> Elizabeth, the queen, Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jaime. Uh, well, uh, during the pandemic, maybe, no, a year in 2019, I was invited by the university where I work, the Universidad Clínica Estatal de Quevedo, to be part of the team of the, um, to create, so to build from scratch the eh, Licenciatura en Pedagogía de las Lenguas Nacionales y Extranjeras. So now they are in the third semester. And finally in Quevedo, uh, there was a huge need in that region, in that part. And uh, it was a very interesting experience because that came to my mind and it still comes to my mind. Uh, I, when I was reading the question, in, what if instead of where we can become English teacher, we ask ourselves, what is the role of teacher education program? Uh, because one important thing and one important aspect in this process is to wonder ooh, and may, uh, ooh, the teacher education programs are supporting or are helping not only the public policy, but the teacher's needs. And the, that is a huge question. So, and that invites all of us to review and analyze, not just the undergraduate programs, but also the postgraduate or even the master programs and, and see what they need and how they fit and they, how they fulfill our needs. So then we have a new program in the Universidad Estatal de Quevedo that helps that part of uh, the central area in the coast that um, is a new proposal. Uh, one of the weaknesses that we had in that process was that our intention um, was to present a program at least with 80 or 85% in English. But uh, we found out that there is a law as well that required that at least 40% of the subject should be taught in Spanish. And uh, we had to change a little bit the, the, the subjects and the, uh, to analyze again the macro-curricular aspect because we had to change some of the subjects that we have in English, totally in English, we had to change it to Spanish. And that is another thing that we need to analyze. So, and again, there are some top-down decisions that they are there and uh, we go back to the first point when we started this panel the public policy in general um, is uh, supports what English teachers need to do their best in the classrooms. Um, what is the role of the teacher education programs in that process? What is the role of the master's programs in that process? And of course the PhD that we are all, uh, most of us taking our PhD in, in education not necessary in English teaching because that is wide expensive. <laughs> it's hyper wide expensive. Uh, but again, um, uh, that, is, that is my question and my concern and maybe a research in the future, right, Ennis? <laughs> we could analyze that, that would be good. Definitely, Elizabeth. Yes, let's work on it, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank yeah. you so much. And now we are going to the last question. And the last question is, uh, where, no, no, no. What are the English teachers associations being in existence in Ecuador and how productive uh, uh, they are? I don't know if somebody wants to talk about it. Uh, I don't know if I can share with you, Jaime. Uh, please do, please do, Queen Elizabeth. Let the me first. Elizabeth the first, yeah, the first. No, I don't think that I fit with the first one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me check this. Let me see if I can share something with you. Yes, yes, of course. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm sharing with you something that I stole from 
a project that I had the opportunity to work with uh, my dear friend, Natalie Kuhlman. She was an expert sponsored by the US Embassy by 2010, 2012, in which the Minister of Education adapted adopted and adapted by this uh, model for the TESOL uh, teacher education program standards for Ecuador. This was, um, this was part of a proposal that the Ministry of Education decided, by then decided to accept. In this case, uh, we identified the fifth domain as TESOL, so there are uh, five domains, the first one connected with language, culture, instruction, assessment, and then we have professionalism, as you can see here. Uh, part of the problem that we have seen is that from these standards, our main concern, and uh, I, mean, I would say the public policy as ma main concern is language. It's language acquisition, how proficient teachers are. Um, and then when we try to cope as the fifth domain as professionalism from, teacher, uh, from teachers association, one of the main difficulties that we faced is that teachers were so overwhelmed reaching their proficiency or so overwhelmed in, in uh, doing all the other paperwork or things or, or or taking the new um, re requ uh, requirements from the, from the Ministry of Education. And when we invited teachers to be part of an association, most of them, they said that they needed some extra time to fulfill of their responsibility. And it's been very difficult to keep a consistent team of professionals because this is, this is something voluntary. So then we changed the approach instead of uh, instead of uh, being uh, keep building and uh, working with a teacher association, we decided to become active members of a professional network. So I did work better. So as a professional networks, we had the opportunity to contribute with Latin American or with international efforts. Again, teachers associations in Ecuador still need to be consistent and sustainable and it requires commitment since this is a very voluntary job from Equatiso that was one of the organizations that we uh, we want to still uh, inviting some people to be part of it in order to fulfill these five domains and connect and be part of it so it's a still no late but it requires time and free time, it requires commitment. And, uh, and uh, that is one of the main difficulties uh, from Equatiso side has, uh, has faced. I understand that there are some other uh, associations, but they have also working on providing some language proficiency uh, goals itself, but uh, the idea of Equatiso was to promote uh, research and publications and uh, to build a consistent network of educators in order to solve some common problems that teachers have in the classroom. That would take time, that would need again people because three, four people or just the board can not do magic, but uh, if any of my colleagues, if my colleagues here are interested in being part of a network of educators, we are more than welcome to have you there. So that's, that's what I can say. But the idea here is to our goal is to work on the fifth domain, to work on professional development, to uh, work on partners, partnership and advocacy. And of course, we require an ethical commitment. Okay, thank you, dear Elizabeth. If you if you can stop sh sharing your screen. Sure, I'm working on it. Okay. Anybody else? Dennis, Irma, Luis. Something to say about uh, English Teachers yeah. Association in Ecuador? Yeah. Well. Okay. Go. Okay, Irma. Irma, please. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, probably we don't have a strong history in the association of teachers. We used to have Fenapiupe. Um, I remember that name from my time when I was getting the certificate and teaching elementary high school level. Uh, that was an association that existed. Uh, we registering, we paid a fee. And yes, there was one event, I think in a year. But I think I, I was not inside the committee. I was not part of the board. I don't know the story, the, the inside story of that organization, but that slowly vanished. Uh, I have heard about this Mineduc, which is private. Again, I still have to do research. I don't know what they're proposing, what they're offering. Uh, and then, yes, we heard about a Quetiso, but I just heard from uh, Elizabeth that they are inviting other colleagues to be part of the board so they can help pursue the goals and the uh, objectives of a Quetiso and the benefit of the English teachers. So I will say probably, yeah, we don't have a strong history of association. Maybe we should, maybe we should. But again, yes, it's time consuming. Oh yeah, it's time consuming. We all here know and have been involved in organizing national or local national and international conferences. And we know how time demanding. Uh, we know that sometimes, and this is probably sad, but sometimes when you offer free training in an institution, yes, some people come, others, they just look at, huh, it's free, so it may not be good, and things like that. Um, so I don't know. We still have a lot of way to go in training our minds to recognize that it will be better if we belong to a network like this one. And of course, if we belong to a network uh, locally and nationally wise because we learn from each other. Of course. We have weaknesses, we have strengths. I don't know it all, but maybe I can share from my point of view and from my experience something that it would help the institution or the association grow. And that's what we need, okay? That's my thank, saying. Thank you, Dia Irma, and then uh, Luis, and then, then, and then Luis, I guess is the only one, right, to talk. Dennis. Oh no, and Dennis, and Dennis, I'm so sorry. Yeah, he was the gentleman who let me yeah, speak uh -huh. before him. Thank you, <laughs> Dennis. Okay, uh, no problem, yes. Um, <laughs> I mean, um, well, we, we, I think we, we, this question came a long time ago when you were here in Ecuador, which was the last time we saw ourselves, you know, physically because Danny has been online. Uh, remember that we were there with, with Tito and and, we, and, Ger we discussed. And, Germaine and, Ger and Germaine McDowell. And Germaine McDougall, yes. And we were there and uh, and uh, you, you asked that question and I'm gonna answer the same way I did. And I did this in front of Tito, okay? So I do believe that uh, Ecuador, uh, unfortunately lacks of an association that is constantly uh, motivating teachers and creating these events in order to improve uh, the teachers' perspectives of uh, methodologies, whatever in English, okay? And, and when I see that uh, uh, Peru's uh, TESOL association is organizing something or the Argentinian, TESOL Association is doing something or the one in Chile because my teachers uh, present in these events uh, all year long and I know that they're going there and there's a huge envy in me that here in Ecuador that we have amazing professionals, uh, Ecuadorians and, and foreign uh, professionals in this area that we do not have these, you know, being, uh, and I'm not just talking about uh, the TESOL, I'm talking about all the rest associations we have had in this country. Since, since a long time ago, I remember Fenapiupe and uh, all these uh, have done and, 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 and improved a lot in Ecuador, but then somehow they have uh, disappeared. And, um, 
And it's, it's sad because we have new teachers coming. We have uh, also uh, teachers who are young in this field. And of course, the, the old teachers, I mean, in experience, uh, that are also needing this association to be strong in order to to um, be in the in the map as the rest of the other associations are. What I can tell you guys is that it, there is one that is it's it's working. It's called Rami, the wow. Red Red Academica Nacional de Idiomas. It's not for everyone because it's basically for in the diversity. directors. Mm -hmm. is the directors uh, of English programs in non-career uh, English uh, subjects and of course in, in English careers. And, and basically what we do and the president of the association, which is looking forward is to improve, uh, to fight when these laws come and everything and try to uh, look for a better uh, treatment to the teacher, teachers nationally. But uh, Rani is just a small, a specific group uh, working toward a specific goals. Um, and this is not like a whole Ecuadorian association that we should have. So uh, I do believe that we must do something. If TISO was created, as I know, with the uh, approval of Senesit and SES, we should somehow uh, get together and, and, and start having these in, uh, association work as it should and uh, having, you know, the seminars, inviting people like before Cope used to do when Elizabeth was leading the institution. And then we try later on to do it also. But yes, we right need it. to have, yes, we need to have these events uh, with high, you know, stake presenters and uh, I remember that last time we had our last cafe conference, uh, we brought Mary, which I see in the chat, in the Facebook live chat, Mary Goodman and some other presenters from, from, from all, you were here also, Jaime, uh, in, yes. in cafe presenting. That's where you met uh, Irma and some other people. Yeah. But I believe that it's a must. If, if we want to have Ecuador uh, improving these, uh, uh, positions that Luis uh, presented, which uh, as, as some people are commenting on the on the chat, well, it's 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 something because there is no international way of positioning countries. But the reality is that there is no is whoever wants to do the open uh, test goes in there, does the test, and then EF comes with the results and says you're in this position. But there's no like a. a, a Law, well, rules or procedures in which to come out with these tests. It's not measured by, for example, the high school where we used to work, they, in order to graduate bilingual, they had to uh, pass the official TOEFL IBT test. And I'm talking about uh, it closed in 2015. And from there on, like 10 years before that, they have been doing that. And all, most of the students, around 90% of them, graduated with at least a B2. And, and you know, that's not measured in there. So it's whoever goes into this free test that it's uh, offered online, mm -hmm. does the test, and then they come with these results and say, okay, you're in this position or this position. But what happens if I tell my students, my university students who do uh, uh, proficiency international exams and, and tell them, okay, to, as a test, for this uh, partial, you guys need to go into the EF uh, platform and I need you guys to get over V2. And I'm gonna have around a hundred students going in there doing this test and passing with a V2 and then we will get our position higher. But it, again, it's not measurable. It's, it's just a small portion of whatever else Ecuador is doing, but it is something. I mean, Rhys already said it. There is not a lot of research done in this country about yes. what's going on in Ecuador. And it's, 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 it's important to start doing it. So at least that's what I wanted to share about associations. So until we don't have the associations working as they should, we should be um, try to be part of these um, uh, networks of professionals, English professionals, ELT professionals, or become uh, create our own communities of practice inside our workplaces. Thank you so much, dear Dennis. We still have five more minutes, dear Luis Bermudez, back to you. 
your mic, Luis. I always forget. Sorry about that. It always happens to the best. To the best. Speakers. You know, the problem is, I don't know if you know the situation in the south of Guayaquil. All the noisy people live there. <laughs> so I what I what I when I'm listening to you, what I do is I, I turn off the microphone so there are no disturbances, you know. <laughs> Sorry okay, about that. Question okay. for dear Luis, question for Fena, Fena Pupe is the one association that always comes to my mind. Is uh, what happens with these organizations is that the, the main benefit that you get, in my, the way I see it, out of them is the congresses they organize, the, the workshops, the, the, the training workshops that they organize. Sadly, Fenapupe died long, long ago. Um, in the beginning, in the beginning, it was very closely associated to one university, Laika, I think. And then yes. there was Centro de Lenguas Extranjeras in, in Espol, if I'm not mistaken. And that, that is the thing about these uh, teacher organizations when they, they come out, they always have some strong support. They're always associated to some university or to, to some educational institution. For example, uh, the Coupe Congress, it used to be, it used to have a backup and, and several actually, but I think that the strongest one came from, from, from Coupe itself. From, it was really from the M uh, through Coupe that, that supported these congresses. Mm -hmm. And they also have another characteristic. There is always another a person behind all that, or a group of committed people. If any of these elements is not there, then they don't happen. So <laughs> at the beginning, it was the Coupe Congress that was Elizabeth is here, right? I mean, if, if, if she hadn't done anything, no Congress. And then I remember that the last one that was Dennis. Dennis, Dennis, okay, I remember Dennis. And you can see the, 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 the effort that is behind all this. Mm -hmm. So my admiration goes to you people. Also, when, when, when Irma was uh, the director of Copay, they have uh, also events. I was part of, of, of some of those. But you can see that the effort and the time, the, the, the lot of commitment that is there, wow. And they all deserve a tip of the hat from, uh, from the rest of us who benefit from this, uh, this uh, efforts uh, that they make. Right now we have, uh, I think that this Ecuador is, is, is still out there. Uh, but as I, said, as I said, there are many problems money-wise also, because it requires a lot of time and money, all right? And uh, the, as, I, as, as I said before, the pandemic also, it was kind of divisive and, and as, as it brought some positive things, it also brought a lot of negative things. Um, there are no many congresses or events like they used to be in the past, at least not in, in, in Ecuador. And the last one I, I, I know of that was like some weeks ago, it was organized by Universidad Casa Grande. Mm -hmm. It was really good. It was really good. I, I also was part of that. So I was, right. yes, also Elizabeth, Irma, you were, you were part of that. That was a great opportunity for those who, want, who wanted to see what's, what, is, what was new in mm -hmm. TEFL here in Ecuador. I think that was, a, but again, so you see there was an organization connected. There was people or a group of people. You need a team. Uh, you need a team of people effort working. There. And, right, mm -hmm. right, right. And the if those things are not there, right. Yeah. Ex yeah, uh, so people need that. to know that this is volunteer work. This is volunteer uh -huh. work. And how, yeah. any how committed. And, and as I told you, so we've been trying to get together with people. So we have been always open to new projects because there are several projects. And uh, another thing, there is a huge uh, confusion between what is the role of a teacher association. So we, uh, as teacher association, or as part of teachers association, we are part of TESOL International and some other uh, associations. Right. Uh, there are different, uh, there are different benefits that we can get at it. Not only the teacher training benefit, but uh, but uh, helping and being part of a, of a, or uh, or contact with different community or different networks of professionals all over the world. But uh, again, I think that we have, as Dennis said, uh, we have a um, micro vision of an association. So we just give up and we say, okay, what I do, as Luis also mentioned, 
as um, they are individual efforts to do things. So, and we don't understand that maybe working together so we can improve things. So that's it. <laughs> okay. Up. Okay. Thank you so much. As our good friend Hector Lavo used to sing, todo tiene <laughs> su final. Nada dura para siempre. So thank you so much. Before we go to the, your final words today, I want to thank you mm -hmm. all. And I want to thank Ecuador because one of the first places I visited and, 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 and asked me to go over there was Ecuador. I remember Fenapieu, Fenap Fenapiupe. Fenapiupe. Fenapiupe, uh, Rebecca, Rebecca, I guess was the president. Rebecca Vera. Vera. Yeah, and she, and, she, and she invited me and she paid some of that staying and the food. And the same thing happened with other institutions where Irma and, and, and Dennis were there. And I remember Luis Bermudez when I met you over there and I said, hello, I'm Jaime Ancajima from Peru. And he said, come on, who, who doesn't know who you? Who doesn't know Jaime Ancajima? <laughs> yes. And, yes I really, I and I really felt appreciated. And, and that's because we love what we do. If we didn't, we weren't here. It's been like two hours sitting here together uh, and leaving your, your children, your grandchildren, your family, your husbands, mm -hmm. whoever is next to you. And, and I want to recognize, I want to uh, acknowledge, I want to thank you and express my gratitude for all the information you have shared <clears throat> and all your opinions, ideas from you. And before we go to your final words, let me show you what people have written in Facebook. Arturo Phil Burgos from Peru, who is uh, the president of one of the associations here in Peru says, remember everybody has to be involved in the learning process of our students, the teacher, the student, their parents and society in general, including our governors. Uh, Mary Godman, Goodman, uh, she's mm -hmm. from the USA, but lives in Argentina. The pandemic forced us teachers to learn how to teach very quickly via Zoom. But as Ismar said, not all of the Ecuadorian students had a computer, cell phone, or Wi-Fi. Uh, teachers had very hard job, and many students didn't have access to the online classes. Then, when the hours of required English and fluency levels were reduced, it's understandable that then that the general levels of English went down. I've heard that the US government has a program in Ecuador where they give ESL classes to Ecuadorian public school teachers, wow. Marta Ogoño, it's a shame that some principals and advisors think the projects need to be translated and that's enough. Some of them don't know the transcendent role of English teachers. Dalia Tiki right. Quiroz, thanks teacher Irma, teaching in rural areas is challenging. It's Very. wonderful, it's, it, 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 it's everything. Uh, yes. we, we, we applaud <laughs> people and teachers who work in the rural and jungle areas. My Dania, tribute to them. And teacher Irma teaching rural areas is challenging. Thanks to, oh my goodness. It's uh, repeated. <laughs> baby, why school teachers should have a minimum C1 and university professor C2. They should be required to take mandatory international exams every two years. Oh my God, oh my God, every two years. If doctor, lawyers, accountants, et cetera, are mandated to constantly update their knowledge, why not teachers? If we don't, we devalue ourselves as professionals. Katia Mara, Teran, great meeting, Jaime, ha, 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 ha. You are still with the last meeting slides. Good to see our colleagues. I did it on purpose. I did it on purpose. <laughs> Katia yeah. Maria. To, see to we check people's attention. attention. Yeah, to, 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 to check if you were paying attention or reading your Facebook comments. <laughs> Arturo, again, remember our learning process are everybody's responsibility. Mike Rivera, let me know about our show like this. Thank you. Well, dear Mike Rivera, all the, the links are in my Facebook account. I do not send a personal or whatever. Okay, so just contact me. Uh, okay, dear my Rivera, Arturo feels again. Oh my God, this Peruvian teacher, my friend. The main problem, oh my dear Arturo. <laughs> the main problem with teachers association is the lack of constant flow of economic resources to pay all the bills. The work that the board members do is not paid. Mm -hmm. We give our time for free. We need to hire an administrator, a manager, or somebody to execute our plans. My mother's opinion is based on modern, on many years of experience. Yes. 
Okay, my dear friends, um, once again, thank you so much for your time, your expertise, your opinion, and everything else. So your final words today, Irma, not just only today. Just today, not my last words. Okay, well, what can I say? Uh, I, I, I think is this meeting and everything that has put on the table regarding, again, all those five circles that I've mentioned it, the state responsibility, the university responsibility, the teachers, the students, and then the evolution, the movement of all those five uh, circles. It's what is important to keep thinking about it, to keep reflecting about it, and to start doing something about it. Because we do have the responsibility, not only with ourselves, with the students that we had before, with the students that we're facing now in our classes or in the master program, but we do have that responsibility for future generations. So thank you for this invitation. Thank you for being part of the reflection this morning. Thank you for each piece of information that every one of you has brought to this table. And let's get together again some yes, other day. For face to face this time. Yes. Luis Bermudez, Luis Bermudez. Hey, um, well, uh, one thing that comes to my mind with now that we're living is, is uh, that when we discuss this with my students, when I discuss it with my students, I tell them, okay, probably the big changes are not gonna happen, but the small changes can happen and we can do that ourselves. If we decide to change as, and be, be the best teachers we can be because our students, your students, don't know you yet, but they will eventually. And they deserve to have the best teachers you can be. So if not for you, if not for the country, at least do it for your students. Those yeah. students that don't know that, that their teacher is going to be Miss Irma or Miss Elizabeth or Mr. Luis or whoever, but, uh, but they know. They know they're gonna have an English teacher. So they deserve that best teacher, that incredible teacher, you have the potential to be. And yeah. that is a small changes that I was talking about. Thank, thank you, you. Jaime, for this thank incredible you, dear, opportunity. Dear, dear Lucho Guys, thank you for sharing your knowledge. And I've been proud to be in this panel. Thank you thank so you. much. Elizabeth Ortiz. <laughs> well, um, it's it's been my pleasure as always, Jaime, sharing the screen with you and with, with my colleagues. So it's been a huge responsibility. So to represent a country and share and talk about what happens in our country, it's a huge responsibility. I just wanna, I just wanna leave a message to the new generation of, of teachers and not only English teachers in, in, in general. So just make your profession and whatever you do memorable. You have to be difficult to be forgotten. And uh, whatever we do in the classroom, it has to it has to be kept in your students' heart and help them to try their passion. So we know that our first passion wasn't teaching. So and we need to help our students to find their passion. Just if we do that, we can really, really say that we are helping and supporting our communities, our countries, and overall our society. And take care of your well-being. Never forget. Yes, yes. <laughs> and before we <laughs> finish with Davis, Eduardo Montaño Ormaza, <laughs> <laughs> let, let me give a, a minute to my dear Tania Enchante, who represents the young teachers. She's from Lima. I haven't met her face to face, but she's from time to time present in our uh, sessions. And I thank you for that, dear Tania. Something to say, Tania. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks for um, giving me the chance to of being here and listening to all of you. And I hope to continue joining these kind of meetings that help me to, to grow as a person and to know the reality of other countries. No, thank you, Tania, because your youth, your youth moves, moves us, encourages us, 
<coughs> to continue doing this. And finally, Mr. Dennis Eduardo Montaño Ormaza. I'm bullying uh, you. <laughs> as always, Jaime, we've been together in presentations. You have invited me, I have invited you. And um, always, for me, it's always a pleasure to be part of these events um, and uh, try to at least share a little bit with the ELT community because uh, that's what we need. We need to share our experiences, share our materials uh, also mm -hmm. in order to, to be better, better teachers, better professionals, better human beings. Uh, I know the, the view of what's going on might not be that great, but still, if you are uh, if a young person is watching this and it's willing to become an English teacher, uh, we're all here, I believe, even though it's not the perfect profession, but we are here because we love what we do. Yeah. And uh, we have been doing this for a long time. We have traveled, we have met, interesting people and we have become friends with people from all over the world due to this profession. I'm not sure how many architects or doctors can say, okay, I've been in, you know, this weekend I was in a meeting with people from all over the world. Well, this teacher that I met in a conference in the International Teach Diesel that now writes to me every single day uh, and it's in Europe, in Italy, or in Portugal, or whatever. This is the that's the, the the great part about our profession. It has it has weaknesses, but it also has a whole bunch of strengths. And it has a, a, a amazing professionals like the ones are here in these uh, Zoom meeting and also on the Facebook Live that I've been trying to check all these uh, messages. So. Um, Again, I'm, I'm all, always be grateful to you, Jaime, for creating this group. I will love to be part of these sessions every weekend. You know that because of time, it, it's, it's really hard for me because my classes normally are, are Saturday and Sunday, but I'm, I'm always be trying to give you a hand and I will always say yes, if I can, to your invitations. So thank you guys. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Irma, Luis, thank you, Jaime. Tanya. Well, Marco and Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Irma, Luis, Elizabeth, Dennis, Tania, Marco, and all the people who were listening and learning from you in, in Facebook Live, Arturo, Marcelo, Mary Goldman, Marta Castillo, eh, Marta Ogoña, Roxana Berrospi, Jacqueline Reyes, Ara Salas, David White, eh, Marta Castillo, CACP. I don't know who that person is. Arturo Phil, Dalia Tiki, Mary Goodman, Roxana, Rospi, and, and everyone else. F see you uh, in two weeks and have a nice weekend weeks. and keep safe. Good okay. bye.